The Man with Night Sweats by Tom Gunn appeared in the 1992 collection of the same name, in which the poet, in a series of 17 poems, elegizes those lost to the HIV-AIDS epidemic, which the final two decades of the 20th century had disproportionately brought to the gay community. HIV is a viral infection, passed on either through sexual contact or through contact with contaminated blood, such as via needle sharing or transfusions, that attacks the body's immune system and causes AIDS, acquired immunodeficiency syndrome. There's currently no known cure for HIV, and treatment in the form of antiretroviral medicine to suppress the replication of the virus and keep progression from HIV to AIDS at bay was not developed until the late 1980s. A gay man himself, although Gunn never contracted the virus, dying of heart failure in 2004 at the age of 75, he had already lost a number of his close friends to the disease by the mid-1980s at a time when its spread was widely misunderstood, its largely homosexual sufferers were heavily stigmatised, and a diagnosis was a death sentence. He once wrote, I had assumed that I would age with all my friends growing old around me, dying off gradually one by one, and here was a plague that cut them off so early. The poem is a dramatic monologue, where the poet takes on the persona of an anonymous man dying from AIDS and explores themes of nostalgia, isolation, pain and mortality, even though the disease itself and the man's impending death are never explicitly mentioned. The man wakes in the middle of the night from a fevered dream, alone, to find himself cold and covered in sweat, his sheets soaked. He remembers his youth and the risk-taking he indulged in, which, at the time, gave him the illusion that he was invulnerable. Now, painfully aware of the reality of his vulnerability, his mind ravaged by anxiety while his body is ravaged by disease, he knows that he must get up to change his sheets. Instead, he pauses to hug himself momentarily in a futile attempt to find comfort and protection from the immense pain and certain death he knows awaits him. The poem is eight stanzas in length and comprises alternating quatrains and rhyming couplets, with a rhyme scheme of A, B, A, B for the quatrains and A, A for the couplets. Rhymes are generally masculine or single, with only one instance of a feminine or double rhyme in lines 20 and 22, to me, through me. Oblique or slant rhymes, cracked, wrecked, which, signalling breakdown in the form, strike a note of discord and become more frequent as the poem progresses, perhaps reflecting the speaker's growing pain and anxiety and the way in which his efforts to have mastery over his own body are weakening. With lines that are six syllables in length, the poem has a base metre of iambic trimeter, didum, 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 although there is extensive substitution of other metrical feet, such as trochees, dumdi, and pyrrhix, diddy. The way in which the poet chooses a very tight and controlled structure to explore the effects of an illness which it is beyond the speaker's power to alleviate or conquer gives the speaker dignity. Gunn also modulates the rhythm to enhance his meaning by making extensive use of enjambment, with half of the lines featuring no punctuation at their ends. All but one of the stanzas, however, are end-stopped, signalling shifts in focus in much the same way paragraphs do in prose. There are only three instances of caesura, all of which occur quite close together in the first two stanzas. The jagged rhythm these create, perhaps suggesting the momentary confusion and disorientation of the narrator as he suddenly wakes. Gunn's diction is plain and simple. This, in combination with his choice of a first person narrator, allows the reader to empathise with the speaker's suffering, creating intense pathos but never pity. The poem moves from the present to the past and back to the present 
to finish fleetingly in the future. The sections in the present tense give the poem a haunting sense of immediacy, while that in the past, covering the second, third and fourth stanzas, is nostalgic in tone. As the speaker looks back on his youth, the poet's diction is overwhelmingly positive with words such as healed, grew, explored, trust, adored, robust and world of wonders. There is a nobility in the fact that the speaker refuses to apologise for who he is or for his current state to tarnish his memories of good times past. Any regret that he feels is not for the way in which he has lived, but only for the way in which he will die. Gunn also makes use of repetition of the metaphor shield, which appears three times in the second, fifth and seventh stanzas, casting the unspoken disease as the enemy which has been able to breach the speaker's defences. And the adjective reduced, which appears twice in the fifth stanza, evoking the speaker's physical and mental deterioration. Sound patterning techniques employing smooth sounds such as alliteration, world of wonders, assonance of long vowel sounds, dreams of heat, and sibilant consonants, flesh, shield, gashed, link words and the ideas they communicate together to create a harmonious effect. Note that this occurs only when the speaker is talking about the past, which was a golden age of certainty for him. The assonance the poet employs when describing the speaker's current state is, by contrast, sharp, with the repetition of short e eh sounds, my flesh reduced and wrecked, and helps to evoke his current discomfort and fear. The title, The Man with Night Sweats, is a simple one that puts the first person narrator of the poem into an immediate context, which is just enough for the reader who is not reading the poem as part of the collection, to understand what is going on. Although Gunn does not explicitly mention the broader context of AIDS in either the title or the poem itself, night sweats were a common early symptom of the disease and were a sign to the sufferer that they were facing the beginning of the end. The poem begins, I wake up cold. I, who prospered through dreams of heat, waked their residue, sweat, and a clinging sheet. Note how the bluntness of the first clause, I wake up cold, is enhanced by the caesura created by the comma. The verb to prosper means to thrive or flourish, and suggests that the dreams of heat were enjoyable to the speaker while he was experiencing them. Even though these lurid dreams appear to have been induced by fever, there is also a suggestion that they may have been sexual in nature, perhaps reliving his experiences of the past. This sensuality evoked through the lingering assonance of the long E sounds the words contain. The reality is less pleasant, though. Their residue, or what they have left behind, is simply sweat and a clinging sheet. The way in which the word sweat stands alone at the beginning of the line, due to the poem's second instance of caesura, gives it emphasis. The man's isolation is hinted at. The adjective clinging can refer to the act of a person holding someone tight. But in the middle of the night, it is only the sheet, uncomfortably and oppressively sticking to his clammy flesh, that embraces him. We could argue that the antithesis in this stanza foreshadows the telling of the man's history, in that his wakening could also be interpreted as metaphorical, a cold, rude awakening to the reality of his situation after the heady and heated days of his youth, which now seem only a dream. The second stanza switches abruptly to the past. My flesh was its own shield. Where it was gashed, it healed. In the past, his own body was protection enough against injury. If his flesh was cut, even seriously as communicated by the verb gashed, it had the capacity to heal itself. The caesura, indicated by the comma near the middle of the line, 
separates the two clauses and emphasises the speaker's unshakable belief in the inevitability of the body's immune system to restore its health. Note the sibilant consonants in these lines, which connects the words flesh, shield and gashed, suggesting harmony and interconnectedness. The third stanza explores the speaker's youth and sexual awakening. I grew as I explored the body I could trust. The verb grew here suggests personal development and confidence as opposed to physical growth, as he explored his sexuality through the vehicle of his body he could trust, presumably without practising safe sex. A trust which we now know was caused by a false sense of security. He admits that he loved taking the risks that made him feel robust or strong and invincible. Even while I adored the risk that made robust. Note the alliteration of risk and robust. The linking of the two words serve to strengthen their effect and perhaps evoke the self-perpetuating nature of the cycle, where the taking of risks made him feel ever more invincible, which incited him to take even more risks, and so on. The enjambment of three of the four lines of this stanza, which does not permit the reader to pause until the end of the fourth line, helps to evoke the speaker's sense of nostalgia and liberation as he recalls what must have been a dizzyingly and breathtakingly exciting time for him. The fourth stanza continues, a world of wonders in each challenge to the skin. Note the alliteration in World of Wonders, which emphasises the self-fulfilment, pleasure and amazement that he experienced. The phrase, each challenge to the skin, is perhaps not only an oblique reference to his sexual encounters, but also to the test to which he was unknowingly submitting his body each time he had unprotected sex. The fifth stanza abruptly returns to the present. I cannot but be sorry the given shield was cracked. He admits that the only way he can feel is sorry, but it is not for either his sexuality or his behaviour. He won't be made to feel ashamed for being himself. He is instead sorry that his given shield or his flesh was cracked or vulnerable after all and was unable to stop the enemy virus. He is now a shadow of his former self. My mind reduced to hurry, my flesh reduced and wrecked. He's consumed by anxiety and racing thoughts and his body is emaciated and destroyed. Note the repetition of the past participle reduced in the third and fourth lines of the stanza, which highlights how the disease has consumed and diminished him. The alliteration of reduced and wrecked, along with the assonant short e eh sounds in flesh reduced and wrecked, and the guttural consonants of the k sounds in cracked and wrecked, creates a sharp, dissonant sound which helped to evoke his pain. He reminds himself that he has to change the bed, to remove the soaked sheets and replace them with dry ones. His short-term requirements, however, are obliterated by his need to catch myself instead, stopped upright where I am, hugging my body to me as if to shield it from the pains that will go through me. Pinned to the spot, he instead puts his arms around himself in a protective embrace, trying to provide a physical shield to shelter a body that has failed to shelter him as he once believed it would. Gunn once more evokes the speaker's sense of isolation. There is nobody there to hug and provide comfort to him but himself. The transition from the present tense to the future tense in The Pains That Will Go Through Me evokes the speaker's awareness of the fate that awaits him. Note the way in which there is enjambment, not only governing the transitions between lines within the stanza, but also that between the sixth and the seventh stanza, suggesting that the speaker no longer has conscious control over his own actions. The speed with which these lines must be read, perhaps symptomatic of his anxiety, of a mind reduced to hurry. The poem finishes on a bleak and ominous image, as if hands were enough to hold an avalanche off. The speaker recognises the futility of his actions 
even as he executes them. The metaphor of an avalanche creating the image of an unstoppable force which is out of control and which will inevitably engulf him, contrasted with the inadequacy of his hands being used as a shield. Thanks for watching. If you have any questions, please let me know in the comments section below and I'll do my best to answer them. Don't forget to subscribe to my channel for more videos on English language topics and exam techniques and English literature texts.